The next speaker would have been uh, Talea Mayo, uh, but she has a family situation. So Jean Camello uh, is so kind uh, to give the presentation for her. So Jean is from uh, the University of Central Florida and the presentation is gonna be about climate change impact on hurricane storm surge risk. And with that, Jean, if you could start sharing your screen, that would be great. And the floor is yours. So hi everyone, my name is Jean Camel. I'm presenting in behalf of my advisor, Dr. Talia Mayo. So we are basically interested in the coastal region because it is a dynamic area where there is a lot of intersection between physical processes and it is where water land and the built environment interact with each other so a good example for that is hawaii uh, here is a picture and you can see that the coast is lined with both the natural environment where you have the dunes and some greenery combined with the built environment environment such as this hotels right here and the coastal region is also home to more than 40% of the population of the United States. And it's only expected to grow as you have more and more people moving towards the coast. And this region is at an increasing risk for um, natural hazards such as floods and coastal erosion. So one of the naturally occurring coastal hazard in this area is storm surge. And hurricane storm surge is an abnormal rise of water generated by strong winds and low pressure. So you have winds that are blowing over the water and they tend to pile up. And as it reaches towards the shore, it gets pushed up even higher. Although the low pressure coming from the center of the hurricane can also raise the water level, its contribution isn't nearly as much as the wind. So what we know as storm tide is basically just storm surge and the astronomical tides together. And when surge happens during high tide, for example, um, you have like this like interaction where in surge and tides because they're able to amplify the surge heights as well. So there, here are some of the parameters that can affect the, the formation of storm surge. And we are concerned with the hurricane properties. So we, we, in this study, we focused on this uh, hurricane parameters and what is generally accepted that can contribute to having a higher surge would be having a low central pressure, having a large size or radius, and if you have a slower moving storms or having just slow forward or translation speed. And you have this high wind speeds or just very intense storms. And all in all, like this can cause higher storm surge heights itself. So we are concerned because we wanted to study how this hurricanes would look like in a changing climate. And we all know that climate change will have significant impacts on the coastal areas as well. Especially we've seen this um, from the very active hurricane season last year, and we really think this is concerning. So there are different studies on how climate change will have an effect on hurricanes in the future. But for storm surge concern, we keep an eye on projections that says that there will be a shift towards stronger storms, meaning you have higher wind intensity and lower pressure. Um, studies that says there's going to be an increase in radius in size, or if you have just a slowing down or um, the slowing down translation speed of hurricanes itself. So our study picks up from the results of an earlier work by one of our colleagues, um, Ethan Gutman in 2018, where they basically simulated hurricanes from the years 2000 to 2013 um, in the present condition by forcing the wharf model with boundary conditions coming from the era interim model as well. So this same process is repeated again, but in order to introduce the pseudo global warming scenario, they impose the high emissions um, signals or the RCP 8.5 at the boundary. Um, this wharf model is actually very good because um, it is about four kilometers grid spacing. And from this model, 
they were able to recreate 22 storms that were present in both the present and the future scenario. So one caveat though, is that the tracks of this wharf model um, and, and the current storms that are in the Herdat or the best track from the National Hurricane Centers do not really follow exactly um, the same path, but they're very close. And some of the hurricane properties in the wharf simulations differ slightly as well. Um, however, for our purposes, for storm surge modeling, we will take this wharf storms and we will be comparing them to each other with the present and the future states to see how it affects the generation of storm surge. Um, for the storm surge modeling, we were able to successfully uh, simulate 21 out of the 22 storms. So in order for us to be able to simulate um, storm surge using a numerical model, um, we use this model called ADCIRC or the Advanced Circulation Model. It's a full physics model that uses um, the finite element method to solve the generalized wave continuity equation. And the advantage of using ADCIRC is it has unstructured meshes um, and it allows you to have finer resolutions in the areas of concern, like the coast. Uh, the coastline, for example, and you have larger elements in, in the deeper ocean. And this helps out with the speed of computation as well. Um, ADCIRC is able to take in various meteorological forcing. So for, for our study, we use outputs from the wharf model, and it can be coupled with the wave model, such as SWAN as well. So for this study, instead of comparing the results of the surge models to tidal gauges, which is you look at certain heights in, in different areas. What we did is we looked at, or we used two different metrics. Um, the first one is the inundation area, which tells you which places in the coastal regions, which were usually dry land, but are now considered wet after being inundated with storm surge. And the second metrics that we use is the inundation volume, which basically is the amount of water that is being pushed through the shore um, due to storm surge. So what we did is we take the areas which is coming from the metrics before the inundation area and multiply the, the storm surge heights. So the mesh that we use for the ADCIRC model is called the HSOFS mesh or the Hurricane Surge On-Demand Forecast System. Um, it is a, a it is a very good model because it uses 1.8 million vertices, um, which is, um, those are the nodes where you get the, the surge heights from. And it's about 3.6 um, triangle elements. And some of these elements actually um, extend over land, which is um, what we wanted because we're concerned about inundation. So this is the HSOFS domain. And as you can see, it covers um, the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is uh, how how deep the 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 ocean water is, and this green part right here. So you have like Florida, um, the Gulf states. So this green part would be um, the overland coverage for for the domain itself. So just to show you the results um, of the simulation that we did. So this is Hurricane Ike. So above is the present scenario. And at the bottom is where the, um, the climate change signal was introduced in the model. So at first glance, it doesn't seem like there's much of a difference between the present and the future scenario, but you'd see that um, for Hurricane Ike, it's much more deeper red, which means that you have um, higher storm surges for the future scenario. So if you look at the differences between the, the future and the present, right here on the right, you'd see it's a lot more red, which means that um, we're expecting that um, a storm such as Hurricane Ike in the future with this um, climate change signal would result in higher storm surges, which is about um, 25 centimeters to more than one meter. In terms of changes in hurricane um, parameters, um, future hurricane Ike saw that there's an increase in wind intensity, an increase in radius, a slowing down of translation speed, and a lower lowering of central pressure. 
So another example of a simulation we did is Hurricane Isaac. So Hurricane Isaac made la landfall in the Gulf area in 2012. And again, the above one is the present search simulation and the bottom would be the feature. So in the present simulation, you'd see that a lot of the high waters are found in the western part of Florida, which is just above Tampa Bay. But if you look at the future scenario, like this is already gone, and some of the high waters were actually located south, um, southwest Florida, and some of them are here in Louisiana and Texas. And this is clearly shown in the differences between the present and the future. Well, um, compared to Hurricane Ike, here you'd see there's actually a displacement of water. So this is where the water used to be. And now like you can find it here in a, in a different area. So in terms of changes in Hurricane properties, um, Hurricane Isaac in the future saw that there is also an increase in wind speed, an increase in radius an increase in translation speed and a lowering of pressure. However, we think there's other factors that might have contributed to the displacement of water in this situation. So when we looked at the overall changes, so I have here, I have the maximum storage storm surges. So all of the 21 storms, we got the maximum of them. Um, it looks like there's different there's several places that you can see red which is me which means that you have storm surges that are higher than four four meters and in the future what we found out is because of this um warming conditions we can expect that there's a general increase in storm surge heights in the future we also saw increase in both inundation volume and area, and there's just higher surges in more concentrated areas, especially in the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Um, some parts of the um, Florida, the Gulf area, um, some parts in the Carolinas and New Jersey as well. So we also tried to look at um, the hurricane properties and, and how they change with climate and how it affects the inundation. Um, so what I have here is a graphic where we um, rearrange the storms in, in terms of increasing inundation volume. So for all of the um, simulations we did, Hurricane Ike had the greatest inundation volume for both present and the future. And um, the way this graphic is arranged is the darker bands show you um, uh, hurricane proper properties that contribute to higher storm surge. So um, you'd see for wind intensity, you are expecting storms that have this darker blue bands to be It looks like we lost Jean, unless I lost all of you guys. Nope, uh, I think it's her connection. Okay. Hopefully, it comes back in a second. Yeah, let's let's give it a few seconds. Be at the bottom, however. Nope. Nope. She she's gone. Oh, there she is. Oh. <laughs> Jean, sorry, I, I think we lost you there for uh, the last 30, 45 seconds or something. Uh, you were mentioning Hurricane Ike had the, the largest impact currently as well as uh, in the future okay. scenarios, and that's where we lost you. Oh, thank you. Sorry Would you be that. able to pick it up from there? Um, yes. Um, are you able to see it now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, so sorry about that. So again, um, so this rainbow graphics that we have basically, um, what we did is we rearranged the storms from the least to the most um, inundation volume. So for for both um, the present and the future scenario, we actually have Hurricane Ike that had the most inundation volume. Um, so the way this is arranged is the darker bands represent um, the Hurricane properties that we think contributes more to um, 
to more ingestion volume. So uh, the darker blue for wind intensity, um, you get a darker orange for radius. Um, since slowing down translation speed contributes more, so we flipped it. Also, pressure was flipped. Um, so we usually expect that having a higher wind intensity would contribute to more inundation volume or more storm surge. However, what we saw is you have storms that have darker color bands than Ike. Like for example, you have Irene and Ophelia right here, um, but they are not at the, I guess like at the bottom, which means like they have more contribution to, uh, uh, st sorry, um, storm surge inundation volume. So what we saw is, if you look at this last five storms that have the higher inundation volume, we don't see really any significant pattern or this combinations of hurricane properties that would possibly have a positive effect to um, storm surge volume itself. So what we did is we take this um, percent change to sort of like uh, I guess like normalize the hurricane properties versus the hurricane volumes. And what we see was quite interesting. And here we have again, the properties that are known to increase surge, which is in red. So um, having an increase in wind speed, an increase in radius, um, a slowing down of translation speed and um, a decrease pressure would be in red. So what we see here is Ike had the largest volume in present and the future climate. However, the change between those two is just about 32%, which is fairly small compared to um, Francis, for example, which saw the largest change in inundation volume, which is about 161% change. However, if you compare um, the properties between Francis and Ike, for example, they're, they're very different. So I saw an increase in wind speed, an increase in radius, a slowing down of translation speed, and a lowering of pressure. However, the largest change, which is Francis, had a decrease in wind speed, a decrease in, um, in radius, um, an increase, uh, sorry, a decrease in translation speed, and a decrease in pressure, which is very different. So that's, that's what we saw with all of these storms when we looked at um, 21 storms as a whole. So just to recap, what we've seen here is we've seen an increase in both inundation volume and area over the 21st century. And we think this is increasingly important because um, we are actually expecting higher surges in more concentrated areas and it would have significant impacts in the built environment. Um, I would also like to point out that these simulations do not have sea level rise yet. And we think that if you add these signals, it may further exacerbate these problems as well. And one of the surprising things that we saw in this um, study is we saw that the changes in inundation or the magnitudes of storm surge is not easily predictable by a single hurricane characteristics. And even if you, so you look at them as a whole, if you take them all together, it's still difficult to predict the outcomes without doing the actual numerical simulations itself. And um, if you are interested, if you want more information and details about the study, um, we have a paper that's out now and I have this like QR code for your convenience. Thank you. Wonderful, Jean. That was a very nice presentation and it close to my heart because I'm, I'm really fascinated by, uh, by hazards, natural hazards. So, so very cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, let's say a couple of minutes uh, for some questions. And again, if you under reactions, there is a raise hand. If you could use that, that would be great. But you can also pass your question in the chat. And I give it a minute or something or a few seconds to see if there are any questions coming in. And while waiting, maybe um, we had yesterday, we had a talk uh, 
uh, from uh, our REA. Um, and he talked about beach suppletion and how uh, different that can be between various communities uh, of wealth. Um, and I imagine that those beach suppletion can change over time as well. And I, I'm just wondering how this will, you know, beach nourish, nourishment basically, right? That, that's, um, that will impact storm surge as well. And if those policies are changing over time. And I'm just wondering if you're um, planning for future scenarios to take some of those human con controls into account where you have a you know, pure natural system versus uh, beach nourishment, uh, very sparse versus you know, lots of nourishment uh, going on. Are you, are you guys thinking in that direction or are you focusing more on, a, on a changes in, in natural parameters? Um, that's actually a very good question. We haven't really looked at that. Um, we were more, I guess like for this study, um, part of this actually is they also looked at precipitation. So that's another thing that um, my No, no. Okay, apologies for the technical issues. You can see if it exacerbates. Is that we're 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 losing you there? Uh, can you can you give a brief summary of what you just said? Yeah, I'm sorry. So in, in terms of in terms of the, the modeling itself for the ADSERG model, um, what we can do to add those scenarios is we could change the mesh, um, the bathymetry of the mesh just to um, add in like new built in environments, or we could also change the friction. Um, if, if you have like more vegetation, for example, in those areas. So those are um, the ways to I guess like add in like all of this new changes that could um, help prevent having storm surges, storm surges and flooding in the future. Yeah, thank you. And there's one other question in the chat um, and this from uh, Brett Murray. Uh, why did inundation from Francis change so much when individual characteristics didn't? Um, so Jurgen Francis is actually one of the interesting ones that we saw, um, what we were thinking is it's possibly because of the, um, there's also a change in track. And those things actually came naturally from the wharf modeling itself. And um, I guess like these changes go beyond from what we were looking at. So um, we're thinking it's possibly because um, Hurricane Francis was, the future Hurricane Francis was, act was actually hitting closer to land. And that's why it had more um, inundation volume or flooding.